In this module, I'm going to be presenting the single source shortest path algorithm invented by Dijkstra. It depends on a heap data structure, which I've introduced in an earlier module. And I strongly encourage you to have at least reviewed the concepts from the heap module in this course to best prepare you for the material in this module. The single source shortest path algorithm is described as follows. Given a graph with vertices and edges, and the graph itself is directed, and every edge has a potential weight associated with it known as its cost. In real world domains, that cost could be mileage between two cities, or it could be shipping costs. What the algorithm is intending to do is compute an accumulated shortest path from some specific source vertex, S, to every other vertex, and try to find the paths to all vertices so that there's the shortest path for each one is being computed. We have to make some assumptions, namely that each edge weight is positive, can't be zero even, it has to be positive. I'll also assume that the graph is simple, which means there are no loops of an edge that goes from a node back to itself. And between any two vertices, there's only one distinct edge between them. To demonstrate the single source shortest path algorithm, let's make sure we understand the problem, and then we'll be able to look at the code. In this graph that you see here, my special designated source is S. And I've got five other vertices. I'm trying to understand how much accumulated cost will I find by making a path, any path, from that source vertex to each of those vertices in turn. We can start with the initial assumption, clearly namely, that the shortest path will be the edges that I might have already in the graph. And as you see here in this particular example, that source vertex has three edges emanating from it to three different vertices. And I'm going to create an array called the dist array for distance that keeps track of the best cost that we've computed to date from the source vertex to the other vertices in the graph. Initially, that dist matrix will contain only information from the original edge set. The dist entry for the source vertex will remain 0 because there is no edge or any way to get from S back to itself. I'm concerned about the distance from S to every other vertex. And I will populate the values of the dist matrix with the edge weights associated with the corresponding edges. And that's why you see 6, 8, and 18 appear as the first few values in the matrix. The other two vertices I have no information on, and so I will just insert infinity as my current best cost that I'll be using for the dist. In this arrangement, I start with the premise that I am currently visiting vertices, and the only one I've visited so far is the source. If I could find a way to expand my search and compute some problems so that I can use those problems later to solve other problems, I'd be finding a way to break up this problem into distinct subtasks, which after all is exactly what we've seen in other algorithms in this course. In this particular approach, I'm going to introduce a strategy called a greedy algorithm approach. When faced with a decision to make, in this case, do I traverse along the edge of weight 6, or do I traverse along the edge of weight 8? You make a decision which is inherently local in scope. I'm just looking at the edges that I have. And what a greedy approach will do is it'll make a decision based on the local information that it has. If it applies this a sufficient number of times, when it's done, I will have a global solution where I've been able to compose that from the individual solutions that I've made along the way. Let's demonstrate how this works with this one small graph, and afterwards I can take you to the code. We'll start with this initial setup, and my question is, how do I find the vertex that is the shortest distance away from S? Well, I'm just going to use my intelligence and look at that, and I see 6, 8, and 18. So of those, 6 is the one that's shortest. And what I'm going to do is expand in that direction. Now, I'm not necessarily going to be coloring the vertices yellow as I go along, but I do want to somehow capture the fact that I have visited this vertex. And what I'm really concerned about is making sure that I continually expand my search into the other vertices that I have not yet visited.
Now that I know that the six was the one that was closest, I expand in that direction, and I now do a check. Are there any other vertices that are now closer because I've made this leap to this vertex? In particular, that new vertex that I went to, vertex 1, has a neighbor on the other side, vertex 4. And if you observe, the, the newest estimate for getting to vertex 4 is now 6 plus 11, or 17, which is smaller than the current estimate that I had, which was infinity. So I can update the information for dist of v4 to now clarify that I now know that the distance between s and that is 17. Now, starting from this point, I move on to the next iteration. Where is the next closest unvisited vertex? And now my definition of closest is finally ready for definition. It's not just the, the closest one that you see between uh, the vertex itself and all the way back to s. It's looking at the, in the dist array and strictly there to see of all the vertices that I have not yet visited, which one is the smallest. So I'm actually fundamentally describing a process that makes its decision to do the next step based upon the results of every computation from prior steps. This is a great way of showing how it's reusing earlier subtasks to solve the problem at hand. If I look at my dist array, I can see that 8 is the smallest distance, and that's associated with vertex v2. So let me expand in that direction. When I expand there, has this now introduced another opportunity to shorten the distance to another vertex? Well, vertex v2 has a neighbor v3, whose current distance is 18. But now, with this new change, I can go cost of 8 from vertex s to vertex 2, and then with the cost of 9 back up, this suggests that actually the shortest distance between s and that vertex is 17. Once again, we see an example of an algorithm that is able to uncover a better cost than what was originally available in the direct edge of the problem. I'm going to continue now. And as you can see, I have three vertices that have been visited, and I'm working my way to the other three that are unvisited. Which is the next closest unvisited vertex? I've got two of them that have 17. A greedy algorithm doesn't really care which one it chooses. So it's going to choose one. After all, it's greedy. In this case, it chose vertex 3. However, based upon that, there are no other vertices that I can expand to. And so that part of the algorithm doesn't need to continue. Let me now go on and locate the next unvisited closest vertex. And here, it's going to be vertex 4, which I would then go on in, identify, and change that final distance, which had been infinity, to now be 20. There are no more vertices that remain that are unvisited. So I'm now done. This particular algorithm, as you can see, starts at a very specific location and then sweeps its way through all the way visiting vertices, each one of which, the phrase I used was, is the closest of the unvisited vertex to any of the original results in the dist matrix. However, to do this properly, there are two challenges to actually implementing this. And they're subtle, and you might not have seen them in the description. Let me make sure I make it clear. How do I locate the next unvisited closest vertex? If I can't do that in an efficient way, then what I have is nothing more than an n squared algorithm. If you think about it, one way to go about doing this one is to, at any point in time, look at all my unvisited vertexes and see which one is closest to where I'm starting from. Pick one, make my change, and then go back once again and look at all the n minus 2, and then n minus 3, and so on. That particular approach, as we've demonstrated before, is order n squared behavior. I'm trying to find something that will allow me to produce an algorithm in n log n, if possible, something that breaks that bound of n squared. I also want to figure out a way of modifying my dist values. There's a little bit of a trick here that was just not really worth talking about. When it came time to expand the vertex, I was able to quickly find the, the vertices that were affected, and I modified their values. And then in my own mind, I said, oh, that's now going to be a higher priority one. So the next time I go through, I'll select that one. 
when you're looking at a small problem as a human, you can't always see all the intelligent choices that you're making without even thinking about it. But when you sit down to try to code that, you start to recognize that to do all those things in an intelligent way is going to be costly, unless if I structure my representation just the right way. And so what I need to do is I need to have a priority queue. Let me first describe what a priority queue is, and then we'll describe how I can use it to solve the single source shortest path algorithm. A queue is a fundamental data structure in computer science. It has a collection of objects, and the behavior is traditionally called first in, first out. What does this mean? You add an element to the queue, and in this envisionment, you think about adding it at the tail end. And when you remove an element from the queue, you always remove it from the front. And in this way, you're able to demonstrate the behavior of that insert happens on the tail, and the remove happens on the head. So this gives you the first in, first out logic. Queues are great structures for a numerous set of algorithms, but I don't need just a queue. I need a priority queue. First, let me describe the priority queue, and then I'll explain why I need it for the single source shortest path algorithm. A priority queue will allow me to maintain the basic structure of a queue where the insert happens, as it normally does. But when you remove, the key idea is you don't just remove the one that was added earliest. You remove the one that has the highest priority. And so I'll associate with each element in the queue a specific priority. Then as elements are added, all I need to do is make sure that when I call remove, that the structure itself returns the one element in the queue that has the highest priority. If there are two elements with the same priority, then either one can be returned. To implement a priority queue, there are a number of data structures that are available for us. I've already demonstrated the heap as a useful data structure. And it turns out that you can use a heap as well to store the information that you would want in a priority queue. If you re reflect on the heap, a heap allows you to store as the root the element whose highest value. That's the max heap data structure I've just defined in an earlier module of this course. If you, instead of storing the heap based on the value of the node itself, why don't you associate a priority with each element? And then what I'm going to do is store a heap based on nodes whose priorities are now the discriminant between parent and child. So when I use a heap in this fashion, the element at the root of the heap is the one that has the highest priority. If you have a queue, normally your first thought is you have to keep them in a certain order. But with a priority queue, the order is no longer relevant. All that matters is my ability to quickly find the one of highest priority. After all, this is what a heap will give you. A heap, as you know, will return the maximum element in constant time. You always know what the maximum element is. It's the root. So it seems in a rather tangential way that I've come to a decision that a heap is quite useful as a data structure for representing a priority queue. It's also nice in that the size of the heap is limited. If I limit it to just the number of vertices, then I will always have a heap that shrinks in size. In these algorithms that I'm describing, the single source shortest path algorithm, I have a graph of fixed size. And as I'm iterating through the graph, I'm uncovering different vertices that have yet to be visited. But all the way through, I'm finding fewer and fewer of those. That concept applies here with my heap, where I might start with a heap whose initial size is the maximum that I ever have. And all I end up doing is removing elements from the heap. The reason why this is worth talking about, in the heap sort implementation, as you've seen in another module, I was able to reduce the size of the heap by one each pass through the iteration. And that was a very efficient operation. If you actually add elements to a heap, inserting them, it's a little more cost. And so I want to be careful about how I use the heap to solve the problems that are given to me. What I'm going to do then is use a heap implementation for a priority queue. Here is the one thing that I need to do to make it work for the Dijkstra's algorithm. Most priority queue implementations that you can find readily available, there's some in Python, for example, they don't allow you to adjust the priority of an element once it's been inserted into the priority queue. However, for Dijkstra's algorithm, that is exactly what I need to do. 
Let me go back to an earlier slide and show you exactly what I mean by that. When we were looking through the graph and trying to find the next closest vertex, once we found it, we had to ask ourselves, has any existing distance been updated? And we just quickly scanned over the array, and we saw, oh, of course, look, now that vertex v3 is here, I can now take the current distance, which is 18, I can replace it with 17. And in my mind, I'm not making any issue about this. I'm just seeing the numbers in front of me, and I'm just updating it. But those two values, 17 and 17, are still vertices that are at play, as it were. They're still in the unvisited set. And I still don't know which one to go, which direction to go when I'm pursuing this iteration. And that ability to reach into a priority queue and find a specific element you're looking for and change its priority can be a costly operation. Specifically, it could be order n. If my priority queue is 1,000 elements in it, because I'm dealing with a graph where I've got 1,000 stores and 200 and 500 warehouses, and I'm trying to find the best transshipment costs to send all my goods through that network, I don't have the time to go through that whole priority queue and find each of those n elements to find the one I'm looking for. I need to be able to find a specific element in the priority queue, and once found, change its priority so that it actually is of higher importance. This capability is required by Dijkstra's algorithm. Without it, it's not efficient. I'm going to show you how to make that capability possible with a binary heap implementation. It's called binary heap because it's a very specific term used in computer science when you take a heap and you represent a priority queue using that heap structure. Let me show you the pseudocode for the Dijkstra's single source shortest path algorithm, and then we'll be able to finally get to the code to see how this works. The approach, as I've sketched out here, is just formalizing the demonstration that we showed earlier. I start with my priority queue that's initially empty. And I go through all my vertices. And if there's not an edge in the original graph, then I'll assign a distance of infinity. If there is an edge, I'll put that current edge weight in. And of course, since I'm starting from a single source, s, the distance of s would be 0, because I, that won't factor at all into our computation. I take all the vertices that I currently am aware of, and I insert them into the priority queue using the priority, which is currently their distance as I know it right now. In the example that I sketched out on the slides, it was relatively easy to scan, using my eyes, five or six values to find the smallest one. But that's a misleading assumption. This is another example of being able to solve something in a small example, but when it scales, it no longer works the way you thought it did. I need to have that priority queue so that it maintains not just the vertices that are unvisited, but it maintains their priority so I can find the one who's of highest priority, and that's the one whose distance is the smallest. This is a priority queue where the priority is higher if the nominal value is smaller. It's a common mind shift you have to make uh, in computer science, and it's just worth paying attention to. The way that this algorithm works, I did it by hand. Now I'll show you the formal treatment to it. I go through my priority queue. As long as it's not empty, I find the one who's of highest priority. That's the one which is the closest vertex in the unvisited vertex set, because it's the one that has the highest priority, namely the one with the lowest total cost. Once I found that, I look for all the neighbors of that vertex and see if I found a new potential shortest distance to that neighbor. I do that by computing the edge weight of that edge from the neighbor. And then I remember that dist of u is the current best estimate from source to that vertex u. And then I add this edge to v, and I see if I now have a new shortest distance. This optimization is common in industrial engineering. It's a minimization problem. Once I've determined that my nude length is actually smaller than what I thought was the best distance, I go through and I update my distance, v. But that's not good enough. I need to record that fact. But what about the vertex which is sitting in the priority queue? That vertex now has the wrong priority. I have to go and find it and change its priority. And the term that's used for that is this odd function known as a decrease key. D 
decrease key is the ability to reach into a priority queue and take an element there and increase its priority. Again, using the basic concept that the lower the nominal value is, the higher its importance. That function, decrease key, is only efficient if I take special pains when I construct my data structure in the first place. If you were to take an ordinary priority queue implementation off the shelf from some Python library, and if you were to implement this algorithm, it would turn into an n squared algorithm. And you would wonder why it's no longer efficient. The problem is that you need to have a priority queue that offers the decrease key functionality. And most of them don't. What I'm going to show you in this module is how to implement the binary heap so that it actually has this decrease key available for you to use. Now, I've already shown you a full implementation of heap in another module. So what I'm going to do is show you the code, but I'm not going to go through it line by line. There are differences, of course, but I feel it would be redundant to do all the steps again. So I'm just going to highlight the decrease key operation that you'll see in the binary heap, and then I'll show the Dijkstra's code for the single source shortest path. I'm now going to show an implementation of a binary heap, which is a state of structure that's fundamentally based on the heap that I've already introduced in an earlier module, but is tailored to work as a priority queue. I'm not going to go line by line through each of these because it's longer than some of the data structures that we've done before, and also it's pretty much the same as what the heap was. So I've encouraged you to look at this code after you've seen the video. I've left comments throughout to explain all the different parts. The basic idea is that I need to keep track of not just the element values, but the fact that each element has a priority. So I'm going to keep track of these notions that every element in my binary heap will actually be a tuple that will store its priority, as well as the value currently being contained. I'm going to be using this to store vertex information in the single source shortest path, so I can find the vertex who has the highest priority, which would be the one whose nominal value is the smallest, because that reflects the distance from the source. It has a method called smallest, as you would expect, because that's what a heap will let you do. The heap, in my case, will store the element at the topmost element here. For various implementation reasons, I do the indexing from 1, because it makes some of the code easier to understand. After you've removed the smallest one, as you know, I have to heapify the heap to rebuild its structure. And this while loop here will be the equivalent of the heapify that you've seen before. Once again, finding the smaller of the two children and then swapping with, with the root. Again, notice that this is the heap, which is a min heap. The root node will have a, a value whose priority is smaller than each of its two children. When you implement a heap, you have to know in advance, is it a max heap or is it a min heap? And for this binary heap here, it's going to be a min heap. Separate from that is the notion of inserting. When I insert, I'm going to take advantage of the fact that my heap will never have more than n elements. Because I'm using this for a specific graph problem that's given to me, the number of vertices doesn't change. So I know in advance, when I create my binary heap, I know the maximum number of elements that are there that makes the insert operation easy to perform. And the real trick to this binary heap data structure is the decrease key operation, which you will not find in your regular priority queue implementations. The decrease key will reach on in and in an efficient manner, which means in log k, where k is the number of vertices that are currently in the heap. In log k time, it'll find the current location of a particular value. It'll change its priority to be smaller because it's been decreased. And then it will essentially heapify. You should have at least an intuition as to why this will work. If I were trying to maintain a fully sorted array in a contiguous block, and you were to suddenly shift one element, you know you've got to move n minus 1 elements potentially out of the way. But a heap has this amazing property that it needs to just only maintain local heap properties between a node and its children. So when you call heapify, you will never be changing more than log n elements, because it's only from the particular value all the way up to the root that could potentially change. And so this operation here is efficient 
That means it can be performed in log n time. And I'm just now going to assume the existence of this binary heap class. So you should look at it after this lecture is over. And I encourage you to do so. I'm now going to do an implementation of the single source shortest path in Python. To implement the single source shortest path, I need to have a priority queue that I create and then populate it with my vertex information. You've seen the pseudocode in the slide. Let me just go through that here. I'll start with an initial graph. Once again, I'm not going to create a complicated structure. I'm just going to use a dictionary to record the graph information. This is the sample graph that you've seen on the slides. Some things should leap out at you. For example, vertex 3 has no emanating edges from it. It's a sink. Once you get there, you can't leave. Vertex 0, the original one, had three edges coming out of it. Vertex 1 of weight 6, vertex 3, weight 18, vertex 2 of weight 8. And so that structure will just record all that information for me. To implement the single source shortest path, I need to replicate the pseudocode that I've just shown to you. We start by creating a binary heap whose length is initially known in advance. It will be the number of elements in the graph. First, I need to create my dist matrix to start. I'm also going to introduce the pred matrix, which is the concept that we've seen in other modules. Not only do I want to compute the shortest path to every vertex, I want to be able to reproduce that path at will. So whenever I make a decision to expand from my list of vertices that I know I visited to the closest unvisited vertex, I'm going to record a predecessor link so I can recover that path when needed. Initially, from my graph, I get all the vertices in the graph. And I set the distance to be max int. That's where I have no information. I also don't have any information on the predecessor link as well. My source, the one that I'm beginning this process from, will always have dist of 0. So I set that there as well. The first step of Dijkstra's algorithm is to populate the priority queue with all the vertices in the graph. They'll all be inserted with their distance as a priority. Since the source vertex is the only one whose priority is 0, I know that that will be the first vertex processed. The other vertices for whom I have no edge information, they'll have an infinite cost. So the first time through my while loop, I find the vertex that's of highest priority. And that is the one that has the nominal value that's the smallest, namely the cost from the source to that particular location. Once I've taken that out, I then say, well, for all the neighbors, have any of those neighbors now gotten smaller because of this new vertex? And the way that works is I find all the neighbors of that vertex u that I've just removed. And I get the weight of that edge. And I compute the new len, which is take the current best estimate for the distance from the source to that vertex u, add the weight of the edge from u to v, and let's see if I've got a new distance. If I do, I want to change the value of dist v to record this new len. But that's not enough. The priority queue is still there with all these vertices in a specific arrangement. And I need to change the arrangement, because this one that is now closer might very well be the next one I need to visit, which means I've got to decrease its key. This is the function in the priority queue to reduce the nominal priority associated with that vertex, which means it will increase its importance and might be the next one that I choose. I also maintain my predecessor link so that when needed, I can recover this solution from the source to each individual vertex. And then this loop continues. So we look at this code, and I'm going to look at it through the eyes of someone trying to analyze its performance. I've got a for loop over here, which is order n, another for loop over here, which is order n. But I reflect, when you're inserting into a priority queue that's based on a heap, I may need to heapify with each insert. So this will be order n log n to do that work properly. I'm going to remove one by one each vertex from the priority queue. And at this point, all I'm doing is removing vertices from the priority queue. So this while loop will never take more than n iterations. For each of those, I'm going to get the edges that are neighbors. But I'm only going to visit each edge once. 
So that's another limitation to make sure that this algorithm is as efficient as possible. And when I call decrease key, I have to make sure that that operation is logarithmic, and it will be. It'll be logarithmic with regards to the number of vertices that are in the priority queue, which starts out being n and over time shrinks. So just a casual look at this without getting into any formal description will suggest that this is on order of not just n log n, it's based on the number of vertices you have and the number of edges you have log n. When I have that properly implemented, it's going to return a dist and a pred matrix. Let's just show you what they look like so you can see how this would work. I want to search for the graph starting at vertex 0 as my source. It's going to return two dictionaries, one being the dist, the dist, which is the distance, the other one being the predecessor links. And if I casually look at this over here, these are the distances now, 6, 8, 17, 17, 20. You might remember on the slide how 17, 17 appeared in one of the disk matrix entries. There they are right here as well. So I know it's probably computing it. How do I recover the solution? I'm going to write a solution function whose purpose is to take that distrib the distance and the predecessor matrices and recover the solution. And I made a small little change to also show you the total length, just because that's something that we're probably interested in. Where before we wanted to know that there was a path between two vertices, now I want to know what the cost of that path is. So let's first create those and store them, the, distribution, the distance and the predecessor link matrices. Once I have those, I can now invoke the solution function, which starts at the vertex at the end and follows those predecessor links backwards until it gets to the source. Each time it finds that it's made progress, it inserts that node at the beginning so that I can produce the path in order from the source to the end. And I already know the distance to that vertex before that while loop starts, so I better grab it and then I'll return that in my string as you see at the end. So the solution I might look for is from 0 to 3, let's say, and I'm going to pass in the dist and the pred. And this tells me that it's a length of 17 to go from vertex 0 to 2 to 3. And as you remember, that's the point that allowed me to take what was otherwise one edge of length 18 from 0 to 3, and I found a shorter path, which went from vertex 0 to 2 and then back to 3. If I look at the solution to go all the way to 5, I think it was, that's the one that had the greatest length, the 20. It had to go for all the way from the left-hand side of the graph all the way up and over to the top through vertex 0, 1, 4, and 5. This implementation is necessarily compact because that's the way these algorithms are coded. Every little part of this has a purpose and can't be deleted or tampered with. The nature of algorithms is that they, they represent these best practices of a solution that is an elegant and efficient way to solve problems. When you code them up, the implementation you do should be as clear and elegant so you can understand it just by looking at it. In this module, I presented Dijkstra's single source shortest path algorithm. As I stated earlier, there are certain key assumptions that it makes to be able to process. The first one is that all the edges have positive weight that can't even be zero. Aside from that, you need to have a priority queue that gives you the capability to decrease a key, or in other words, alter the priority so that you can move it up to be of a higher priority in the priority queue. Most priority queue implementations do not offer this capability, but I've shown you a simple implementation of a heap structure which does support it. And so you've learned about it, a data structure, heap, but I've also made a small change to create a binary heap, which is a useful structure to use to implement priority queues where you need the ability to modify priorities after they've been inserted into the queue. I've also demonstrated another fundamental theme in algorithms known as the greedy approach. The basic idea is that you know you're going to break up your problem into subproblems, and when faced with a subproblem to solve, sometimes the best approach is to pursue the best local strategy at that time. And through successive iterations, you converge on a solution which is, in fact, going to be globally optimal. And that's a different approach 
then divide and conquer, let's say, where you break up a problem into subproblems, each of which is half the size, and then you recombine the solution to come up with a single problem. These themes of algorithms appear constantly, and it's useful to see them in context so you can understand how to apply them to your own problems that you have. This completes the single source shortest path description.